eight of Dog Song, and it's called The Run. The light filtered into the skins, and he awakened. Some of the dream was still within him, and he had a great hunger for the coarse red meat and yellow fat. But when he looked out from the skins, he saw only the four deer carcasses. The team was chewing on one. He struck out an arm, an arm out and scraped his parka and turned it right side out and put it on. The cold of the skin penetrated his squirrel skin undergarments and brought him totally, instantly wide awake. Next, he put his mid mucklucks on. They were warm from being in the skins all night. And then he threw back the skins and stood. The dogs had fought while he dreamt, and the gang line was bitten in two or three places. He swore and pulled them back from the deer into the sled and tied them in place, liberally slamming their noses with his mittened hand. In a few moments they had settled, and he went back to the deer. Their bodies had frozen, but were small enough to fit roughly on the sled. Legs stuck out, but he wanted to keep going, and the legs didn't bother him. There were no trees to catch at them. The skins were more of a problem. Though he had slept in them, the raw sides had frozen solid. The hollow hairs had kept his body heat from penetrating the skins, and they would not fold. He finally jumped on them in the middle to fold them over and jam fit them next to the deer carcasses on the sled. He pulled his hood on, tightened it against the coming wind, and called the dogs up. In minutes, he was out of sight of the camp area, heading still north, out into the sweeps. Today was different, as Russell knew all days are different in the north. It was so cold, his spit bounced. White men would call it 40 below zero, and the air caught his throat as he warmed it. The color was new as well. Yesterday had been blue. Today was almost a deep purple with stringers of clouds shooting across the dimly lighted sky. Fingers aimed away from an advancing storm. Russell knew weather as all Eskimos know weather. The storm would come in two days, maybe a little less, but it would not be too bad. Some wind and cold, nothing more. He could ride it out easily. But there was a strange unease driving him, and at first he thought it was the dream. It had been so real seeming. He could still smell the inside of the dream igloo tent, the stink of the mammoth avoiding itself in death, the heat of its blood drawn, the shaft of the lance. He had killed the beast, and yet something was pushing him, making him drive the team. They were new now, a new team. It wasn't that the dogs had changed, and yet they were not the same dogs that he'd first seen at Ugrux. They changed with him, or at least so it seemed, changed with his mind. It was as, as if they had gone out of themselves and become more than dogs, more than animal. They ran to his mind, out and out before him. With bellies full of deer meat, rich guts and stomach linings, the dogs were strong and driving, had great power and wanted to run. He let them run, and they seemed to want to have the same way he wanted to go, and that too became part of his thinking. Do they know him? Do they know his mind and run into it the very the way the wild dogs had run to the man's mind in the dream? And if that were so, which he believed since he seemed to see his thoughts going out ahead, his with the lead dog, if that were so, did the dogs know what they were doing? Did they know when he didn't know? And more, did they know why they were heading north? Why do we run? He asked aloud, and the seven words broke the silence and startled the dogs. They kept running, but broke stride for a few steps before regaining rhythm. They did not answer. Twice he looked back, but saw nothing, and after that he didn't look to the rear again. Out ahead was everything. Out ahead was where they were going, and he let the dogs decide because that was the same as he, his deciding. The snow was right for speed. Didn't have the cold weather scrubbing or sound it did, sometimes did, which pulled at the runners, and they ran the daylight out without losing pace. For five, maybe six hours, he let them run, and as the gray dusk was gathering before dark, he saw off to the right a small valley between two hills, where there was some brush which might make a, f a fire. He said nothing to the team, but they knew, and they curved off to the right to head for the valley. There was still light as they came to it. He stopped near some dried brush, dead in the wind and the snow, Put the do but the dogs kept pulling forward, and he let them go again. Further up, there was an overhanging ledge of stone, a shelf with a place under it to make a shelter. The dogs stopped when they reached the overhang. He used one skin to shield the opening and scraped enough snow to secure it to the ledge. Then he cut a set of front shoulders up and threw the pieces to the dogs and pulled a second carcass into the lean-to. With the other skins, he fashioned a bed and went out and collected bits of brushwood until he had enough to last the night and a little extra. It was a perfect camp. He brought the wood into the shelter and pulled the flap down. Using a bit of moss, he started a small fire, and in moments it was in, 
warm inside the shelter. He took his parka off and turned it inside out and put it back outside to freeze. He heard the dogs growl, but they settled the problem immediately, and he turned to warming meat to eat. Using the point of his knife, he pried a tenderloin off the middle back of the carcass and held it over the small flame. The smoke was bad at first, but he opened a hole at the top of the lean-to, and the smoke was quickly sucked out by the wind. The meat thawed in the flame and was soon warm enough to eat, and he put the piece in his mouth and cut it off by his lips. He was thirsty, and he ate more snow with the meat, alternately chewing meat and eating snow until his stomach started to bulge. He could eat no more meat yet. He was hungry still. He thought of the red coarse meat of the dream, of the rich yellow fat, and he closed his eyes. But there was not sleep at first. Instead, he thought of the day's run, then thought of Ugruk asking if they ran for him. It was a pleasant thought, and Russell lay back on the hide to rest, but there was a lump beneath his shoulder. He was about to ignore it, to leave it there, but it was such a perfect camp that he wanted the bed to be perfect as well, and he folded the skin back to see what the lump was. There was a stone there, a curved piece of stone, and he pulled at it. It wiggled a bit. He took his knife and dug around the edge, pulled at it, loosened it more, then dug again. Finally, it came free, and when it was in his hand, he saw that it was more than a stone. It was a stone that had been worked by hand. It was round, a disc about ten inches in diameter, and it smoothly polished. On one side, it was completely flat, but on the other, it had been hollowed out to form a six-inch dish, one edge of which had been a small groove in it. It was an old stone lamp, older, much older than Ugruk's. Older than the lamps in the museums he had seen that were dug by the college people from the old village up north. Somebody had camped here many years before and either left the lamp or had come upon a disaster which ended as they had begun, as they had been. Only the lamp was left, and Russell held it and wondered at the shiny smoothness of it, the polished beauty. See what a man has been given, he said, by the dogs he brought me, by the night. By the, a man has been given. He had dropped into the third-person usage without thinking, though it was no longer used very much. He had heard the old people talk that way, sometimes out of politeness. He used the back of his knife to scrape the last of the dirt off the lamp and set it aside. He needed some fat to light it, and when he went outside once more to the caribou carcass to get stomach fat. Stomach fat. All right. The best fat to eat is the best fat to burn, Ugruk had said. Save the best for the flame, and you will never grow cold. It is a good lesson for a man. Save the best for the flame. Russell took the stomach fat, pried it off with his knife, it was still frozen, and cut it into chips for the lamp bowl. When he had a small mound of chips, he found some moss near the ledge and fashioned a wick. Then he took a burning stick from the fire and tried to light the lamp. It was necessary to melt the fat into a puddle into the lamp so that it, as a liquid it could be wickified, wick up, wicked up into the moss for burning. After a good hour of moving the chips around and becoming frustrated, he was ready to give up, but he tried once more and was rewarded when the chips of white fat suddenly became fluid and soaked into the moss. Smiling, he lit the wick and set the lamp on a small dirt ledge to the side of the shelter. The fire died to embers, but the lamp glow remained, and the sweet yellow of the burning fat kept the night away, kept him warm. The fat was poor, he knew, compared to walrus fat or seal oil, and it burned with some smoke, though much less than the wood fire. But he did not need wood now, as long as he had deer for the fat, and there were many deer. He could get everything from the deer. He was sleepy now, again full and round with heat and food, but he didn't know how long the fat would last or the wick, so he went outside and spent more, some time getting more fat from the same carcass. When he had a, small, a fair small pile of it cut in chips, he found some more moss and twisted it into the wick for later. He added some chips, chips to the liquid in the bowl and they melted, and he saw that it was easy now to keep the level of the liquid up to the edge. Small crackles of rendered fat floated there, and with quick fingers he dipped them out and ate them as they cooled. He took a thin piece of wood and made a scrape tool to keep the wick even. Then he lay back on the skins as the storm came up, and he looked to all he had done and knew Ugrak would have liked it. Where there had been nothing, he now had shelter and food and heat and comfort. Where there had been nothing, he had become something. The dogs were fed and down for rest, fed on meat and fat, fed on running and cold, fed and down. He could sleep now. He would awaken in the night at intervals to add chips of fat to the lamp or to trim the wick, or perhaps to warm and eat a piece of meat or open a leg bone to get at the marrow, which tasted like the butter at the village store, or swallow a bit of snow when thirst took him. He could sleep now and dream.